Hey, Dan. That's a nice coffee cup you got there. Where'd you get that? Hey, I got that from my buddy Don. That's the Air Warfare Group team cup there, and I'll show you guys where you can get one of those. So mm. this aircraft that we're looking at, the A6M3-32, was originally called the HAMP fighter before it was a Zeke or a Zero? Correct. It was called the HAMP. Yep. And this um, is the and General Hap Arnold didn't like that, so they changed it to Zero and Zeke. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's that's kind of a presence. We have a you know we have the NATO diagram for all the F series. You yeah. know the the Fox Trot or the Fox Fox Bat, the Flanker, the Fish Bed. So is this box original from Japan? No. What what we do when we build um, support equipment for the airplane, there's a lot of uh, peculiar support equipment that goes along with the Warbird. Uh, like the wing jack fixtures I was telling you about over there to sure. support. Yeah. So what we do is we, we try to build... Two of these fit in here? Correct. And yeah. we try to build boxes uh, for the client. And and give them the extra aviance and stuff. Yep. It's hermetically sealed. you got to push the little... <laughs> it's... Uh... Do you think it was uh, painted and then closed? It was. <laughs> so we're going to edit all that out. Yeah. I know how to cut. So yeah. So what we do is those uh, those aircraft supports you saw where the jacking balls are, they all fit inside here. And then what we try to do, you know, just kind of as a nice thing is to make them look like, you know, World War II boxes, you know, they're varnished up. And then one of the things that we, we did is we found, you know, like, like scrapbookers and craft people are using these cutters and all of the to cut vinyl and things like that. Well, for us, that's invaluable because we're taking that industry and, and applying it to aircraft restoration because I can make these stencils with all original Japanese font. And this this is the stencil that's on the side of the airplane. Yeah. Because um, it was the airplane was produced in September 16th of 1942. It's serial number 3148. And I put in the nomenclature here and just try to make it a nice box for the customer to be able to store all the peculiar support equipment in. And it looks, it looks very Japanesey. It looks really awesome. And it looks like, I mean, even though it looks new, it doesn't look replica like, like it's from the period, but it makes that aviance feeling of, like if I was at an air show and this was sitting out beside the airplane, I'd feel like I was deployed with a Japanese fighter. Correct, and it's just, it's just something fun. But more importantly, when I am doing all the Japanese stenciling on the airplane, I have the ability now with the computer and this, this cricket cutter to, to be able to make fine uh, kanji and, and, and put the correct stencils on the airplane. And it, it's just, it's phenomenal for us as a small shop to be able Shit to do is. that. That is awesome. And then you were saying this came out of New Zealand? Yeah, this is a, this came out of New Zealand. This is an A6M3 and we, this, this is invaluable. The pilot had landed it and put a grenade right here. And the yeah. grenade went off and caused all this damage and that demilled the airplane. Yeah. And then also after the war, um, the Japanese would have to take an axe or a hatchet and, and cut the oil tank, cut the airplane, and then it was considered demilled. They kept it from the falling into Allied hands and right. being used against them and everything. And then uh, how much, this is a tail assembly? Yeah, this is the tail assembly from our airplane. This is the original tail assembly. It's got the, the landing gear mount down there for uh, the ta tail gear. Tail, tail hook here yeah oh yeah and the and tail wheel mounted back here so this is for the vertical stabilizer yeah that's here. for the vertical i see it starts to taper right there yeah that's there we go i got my ups and my downs wrong yeah so we can lift it up real quick and again Look at that extremely uh invaluable to have because these are the horizontal um horizontal attach points and all of these were modeled and put into 3D Katia and SolidWorks so we could get 2D production files and, and be able to replicate these. And you said that these came in two parts. The, they were manufactured in two parts. Is this right where the part? No, the other production break is up at Bulkhead 7. So it's another, forward. another 10 feet forward or yeah. 8 feet forward. Yeah. Maybe 8 feet forward. Yeah. And how much weight did you say you guys probably took off of the? Our airplane's around 4,200 pounds. And they, how much weight of the original airplane did you remove and replace? Because you used a heavier gauge aluminum. We, we probably added three or 400 pounds by using modern materials. Yeah. And the, uh, the one thing that Dan was telling me about this airplane is, is the Japanese used metric aluminum and they went as light as possible. I mean, you couldn't put your finger through it, but, but it, you can see here, here's a perfect example of how light the stringers are, how light of material that they used. You yeah. can feel it. 
Yeah. Everything to the Japanese was, was weight savings to yeah. make the aircraft uh, fly farther on, on a tank of gas and to be more maneuverable. Which probably also led to its demise because you hit one critical point with a bullet. You hit a 50 caliber right there, it's going to start a ripping action. Yeah. It, and it's going to unzip the airplane. And our American fighters with their 50 cals and armor piercing shells could do that. That's pretty awesome. So when you guys did the tail and everything, you, you, you went a little heavier on the aluminum, but did you... Did you have to change the center of gravity at all? No. no. The original, uh, the way we made our engine mount, and um, we have a heavier engine. We've got a Pratt & Whitney 1830-92. Uh, it's heavier than the Sakai. So um, the CG of this airplane is really right over uh, quarter cord. It's right where it's supposed to be um, for very, you know, and the zeros were extremely maneuverable. Um, they notoriously had some aft CG. That's why they were so maneuverable. But this airplane is is right at quarter cord. Um, you know, with yeah. a pretty balanced on the wing. Very very balanced airplane. Uh, we don't have a lot of ballast in, everywhere. Um, it, it, it really worked out nicely. Um, How many horsepower? Eighteen uh, thirties, right around uh, thirteen hundred some horsepower. Um, it doesn't have a supercharger on it. Um, it's just a it's a DC three uh, engine. Uh, and a, a modified DC-3 propeller, a San Antonio propeller modified it to, so you took to it down the to, dimensions of a zero propeller. Did you take it down to, it's still a three blade? Yep, yep. still a three blade prop. Um, there's a little over 200 uh, original parts in the airplane. Uh, the main landing gear, the cockpit, it's the most uh, original cockpit uh, in existence that we think today with all the original Japanese instruments, the original Japanese um, setup, it, uh, all the it, instruments were restored and uh, by a company in San Francisco and or in Japan. So a lot of shipping involved in this restoration project. <laughs> so I was, I was thinking that this airplane was going to be moved by now based off of what I was reading on your website or at least on your Facebook and everything. Yeah. And I was very surprised. Now, when you were down at Madras, when we met, and you were taking pictures of their Oscar, was that for this project to help uh, with this, or is that another project? Uh, potentially another project. Um, just wanted to go down and look at that airplane for uh, if, if we were to do an Oscar project. We thought um, that airplane was built by uh, down in Texas, uh, it's a it's a replica Oscar, but it it has an 1830 like we do. It, it has a lot of things like our airplane, but wanted to just see what an Oscar, you know, looks like. I take it you're coming here. I saw that your dad's got some wet paint down here somewhere. Just, yeah, if you can find it, that's good. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> touch it up, always touch it up. Right? Yeah, thanks. So this 1830 is, is painted up to look like a, a Japanese engine with the gray case and everything like that. That was specially painted by our, our uh, engine man, uh, manufacturer. Precision Engine did this here in Painfield. As those cylinders burn time, will they start to silver up a little bit? Uh, ho hopefully not. Precision, uh, they, uh, those are brand new cylinders. Mm -hmm. They were uh, from Pratt Whitney. They bought a license to make them brand new. Um, so hopefully they'll hold their color for a little while. Original. But it is a radial engine. Yeah. It will leak. It'll yeah. get old. Yeah. <laughs> this is a uh, uh, Super Constellation spinner that's been modified to look like the Japanese spinner. Oh, wow. To go on the American... Uh, Off of one of the Connie's? Yeah, it's a Connie spinner. Connie spinner, wow, nice. It's amazing all the different uh, workarounds you have to do to, to, re to replicate something and restore something as close as you can to the real thing. That's pretty awesome. So you can see here, this is original landing gear. Um, that was restored by us. Uh, Interesting on how the Japanese did the landing gears. You can look over here. They could do maintenance on the landing gear 
without having to drain the nitrogen and hydraulic fluid out of it. They just unbolt those they bolts around the star there? And it was a quick change unit. Wow. And these, these are not bomb racks. <laughs> What these are, are these are wing support fixtures that uh, when we jack the aircraft, we spread load. Distributes the load. On, on the front spar and the aft spar. The, the way the Japanese originally jacked the aircraft, they could have damaged the wings very easily. Yeah. So we made those here in house, even though they look like bomb shackles, they're not. They're actually support the weight of the aircraft very evenly when we jack it. And we jack it quite a bit um, to put it in the flight position for maintenance. Uh, right now we're working on the brake system. So that gantry and the jacks are used daily. So this just makes it real safe um, and protects the airplane, protects the, the spar from any kind of damage. You know, a, a lot of people watching this video won't know this, but you basically gained all this knowledge through the United States Marine Corps working on all their helicopters. And um, did you always work on the, the CH-53? I did. I was a 53 guy pretty much my whole career. Um, then I was being around my dad with civilian aviation and then... Lifetime. Lifetime. Uh, and then Ben, our crew chief, 30 years experience in aviation. Um, he, you know, as a fabricator. Um, and now he knows he's probably one of the... I mean, he knows more about zeros than I think anybody on the planet right now. Um, as he puts this airplane together. So it's just a culmination of that. Our, our CAD guy upstairs who does all of our drawings and 3D work and CAD work is Air Force uh, jet engine mechanic. Yeah. So a lot of us are, are former military. Ben was Army, I was Marine. Paul was Air Force. We had a couple other Marines. Um, and then a couple, you know, a lot of our volunteers are, are civilian um, Boeing guys, retired, retired military. They just want to come out. We have a volunteer who's uh, comes twice twice a week and does all kinds of things for us. Nice. Uh, but he's been around aviation for 80 years. Uh, I, I see that as a win-win situation because as, as a volunteer myself, one of the things I look at is projects like this that I can either help do research for or, you know, you know find stuff online that's really yeah. needles in a haystack. Well, our volunteers are invaluable for us. We don't have a lot of them, but um, they have so much knowledge to pass on. And, they, and they've got the experience, especially in the Seattle area. You've got a lot of retired Boeing, retired aviation people that have a lot to pass on. And by having a shop like this where they can come in and we can give them tasks and build things and make things. Um, let's, let's climb the ladder and just take a quick, let me uh, get out of your hair here soon sure. so that I, you guys can get to work. Let's climb the ladder and look in the cockpit. So. So that's, you've got the Garmin G5 there where the gun sight normally is. Yep. And the and gun sight is usually, does it flip out of the way or was it fixed the whole time? It was fixed the whole time. Yeah. And we and saw a replica of that upstairs. We did. Yeah. And then um, those are the replica guns installed, <laughs> charging handles. <laughs> yeah, I see down that. to your left there, um, as you come back, you'll see the throttle quadrant here. And I love that wood. Uh, and that's a... That's a, another real piece that we had, and that looks like a, a brake for a, a, a bicycle is actually the trigger for the guns. Is it? Oh, yeah. so they squeeze that yeah, to you shoot? Can pull that back if you want. It's, yeah, it's, well, see? clear. And those are the guns right there. Yeah. And so so the... down, um, like I said, this is one of the most complete cockpits out there. Is that there. battery light on? It is. Yeah. And that's okay. That just letting you know there you have juice? Yep. Uh, we're really proud of the, the battery, actually, because it's an Earth X lithium iron sulfide battery it weighs only a couple of pounds and it starts this 1830 with no problem wow how many volts 24 24 yeah. and is that an aerial back there uh it is that's the old direction finder um we uh replicated that from an original japanese one and then here is the original antenna that they used let's see this thing look at that did you guys did you guys have to paint the Japanese writing on there? We did all of that, yeah. All that by hand. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. And hand wrapped it. And you were pointing out the uh This is the original antenna the Japanese had yep. with a uh that is a piece of ebonite on top as the insulator. insulator. Ebonite. Yeah, so it doesn't ground out to the airframe. Correct. So we found the ebonite inside of a bowling ball. Oh nice. And then an old bowling ball? Yep. And ran the, the, the wire back and there is a, a real aircraft antenna inside here. Wow, that's pretty awesome. That helps with the maintaining some weight, natural weight and balance too. Yeah. 
and then uh, armor plated windscreen. No, no, no armor plate. No armor plate. So that's one of the things the Japanese did with their Zero, is they sacrificed arming armor, armor, and they, but they had the firepower, and they had the maneuverability and the lightweight. So they had the extended range. Correct. With the you know, and you've got the you showed me earlier, but you've got the only Japanese Zero with a drop tank. Correct. Centerline drop tank. Will that be functional for the flight or would no, it just be? Static display. Static display. The FAA doesn't like things that drop off airplanes. Yeah. No, well, it's static display. I always give for a, safety. my viewers, I give them a hard time about drop tanks. Drop tanks were from World War II. The new tanks are called external fuel tanks. Yeah. They only drop them in an emergency, so. But <laughs> that's, I will, that's a good point though. I'll get off my horse again. So one last look here in the cockpit. Wow, this is really awesome, Dan. A lot of that stuff in there is original. Yeah, these and, and that's in is that embossed writing on the the are these two release red knobs here for uh, emergency gear or something? Uh, no, th those are probably you're looking at the flotation um, emergency flotation. Uh, they have nitrogen bottles that would uh, blow um, nitrogen into emergency flotation, yeah. so the airplane could float. Yeah, it's dual sleeve slots that you pull both bo yeah. nozzles. And then there's also bomb releases in there. You could be looking at two bomb releases. There, oh, those are probably what those are. There's left and right. Yeah, and, and then, the bomb releases. Yep. And then uh, the window on the floor after the rudder pedals there, that is for looking down inside to see if the external drop tank is cleared. Is cleared. Yeah. Um, that's all. So if you see metal down there, you know it's still you know down it there. Go. What's that big blue cylinder thing down there? It's like a... Uh, it looks like it's got a, a aluminum or stainless steel top, but it's a big round blue column that goes down. Oh, that's the that's the the that's the Aotaki painted uh, drop tank socket. That's the locking collar. Oh, okay. So I saw your you had that big probe mm -hmm. coming out of it. And that's what in, goes in there. That's how they locked into each other. Sweet. We'll have and to get a picture. And that blue color is the is the original Japanese zinc chromate. That's, that's their zinc chromate. That's yep. awesome. It's called Aotaki. So you guys just had to clean that up a little bit and left it original? Yep, that's, a, that's an original piece. This is awesome. Well, Dan, I really appreciate this today. I don't want to take any more time out of your schedule unless you want to put me to work sometime. <laughs> you, any, hey, you get to visit one time and then you're a volunteer. Exactly. That's awesome. <laughs> hey, guys. This is Juice. I'm going to sign off from the Zero Project here. This is the Zero Factory now. And uh, I just want to thank Bob and Dan for letting me come around and bug them today. Uh, they don't know me like you guys do, so they still let me in. So uh, we're going to sign off, and we'll see you guys from the Heritage Armor, uh, Heritage uh, Flying Heritage and Combat Armory Museum across the street. Later. <laughs>